Hi, everybody, and we are back with another fill in the blank notes. This time we're talking about this guy, the way famous Alexander the Great. Now, you might be thinking, oh, look, he kept his bullseye thing. I decided to keep it. It could change, but I'm still going with it. All right, so Alexander the Great, the last remaining son of Philip II, after Alexander's mom, Philip's original wife, has uh, Philip and then all his other wives and all his other family members killed. You remember from the notes from yesterday. So um, let's get into some background info. When Alexander takes over, um, when his dad Philip is killed, he's only 20 years old. At 20 years old, he takes over this land of the Greek city-states. Um, he had been no stranger to leadership. He had been a commander in the army since he was 16 years old, and he's super smart, and we're going to get more into that um, in a second. One of the first thing he does is he has his soldiers follow his lead because Alexander cuts his hair and shaves his beard. So the reason he did this, and I literally Googled long hair, long beard person <laughs> to give you a visual for this. Um, so here's, let's say this is a, a ancient soldier, which it's not, it's a Viking reenactor. So the problem with having a long beard and long hair in ancient times is you could essentially just grab, I, I literally just went to do a hand motion through the computer that you can't see. Um, but let's see if I click this, you can, yeah. Oh no, that's not what I want. You can grab the hair grab the beard, and then use it to pull the person towards you as you repeatedly stab them. Um, so Alexander makes it so that his soldiers would have no beards and very short hair so that it's not an issue. Now, Alexander had a very famous teacher. And that teacher is this guy, Aristotle, and you remember him from our Greek culture unit. Um, Aristotle has that cool nickname. Let's see if you remember it. You can shout out his nickname. Yes, he is. Hopefully, you got this right. He is the master of them that know, and he's Alexander's private tutor. He teaches Alexander literature, political science, which you remember is the study of government, geography, maps and stuff, biology. That's life science. Um, and Alexander learned that philosophers and scientists do good things. So he takes them along with his army, not to fight, but to study new things and learn about new people and new plants and things like that. So what the scientists would do is they would collect samples from Alexander's conquered lands um, that he's going to conquer and then send them back um, to Aristotle, who's back in Greece, and Aristotle would study them and classify them and all that. So Alexander is like, I'm going to conquer places, but we're going to do some learning as well, which is pretty cool. All right. Now, Alexander has absolutely no fear whatsoever. He takes on Persia. Now, let me back up and explain this a little bit. So when Philip dies, a lot of the Greek city-states were like, we've been duped. This is ridiculous. This guy's in charge of all of us. He's now dead. We want revolution. And Alexander says, okay, okay, I get that. I get you want revolution, but hear me out first. And Alexander says, because do you know what I want to do for Greece? And the Greeks are like, what? And Alexander says, I want to take over Persia. And the Greeks are like, oh, we've always wanted to get rid of the Persians. And Alexander was like, if you stick with me, I'll make it happen. So the Greeks essentially very quickly become Team Alexander. Now, he crushes the Persian Empire. I'm going to show you how um, in a second. And goes all the way to India. And he would have gone a lot further, but his troops wanted to go back home because they had been fighting for so long. Now, this is an amazing statistic of Alexander. He conquered 22,000 miles of land. That's like more than seven United States worth of land. And even more impressively, he never lost a battle. 
undefeated. Pretty amazing. All right, so this is going to be a little meta, but I'm going to show you. You're watching a video, and I'm going to show you a video. <laughs> so this is um, going to show you his route that he conquered. So he starts over here in Greece. Oh, there's weird music. Hold on. I know you probably like the weird music, but I want to talk over it, so I'm just going to mute the weird music. Um, and talk over this. All right, so as you can see, he starts in Greece. He comes from Macedonia. He takes over the Ionian part of Persia. So the Greeks there are like, who are you? And the Greek city-states are like, no, this guy's cool. So <laughs> they keep conquering, and he goes deep into what's today Turkey. And these things that are popping up are major battles. So this is a battle, Issus, that he wins. Then he is going to go down um, into the old Phoenician land, and there's an epic battle at the city of Tyre um, that he takes over. Then he goes to Egypt, conquers that. Now you might be thinking, let me just pause it for a second. You might be thinking, wow, he just took over this part of Egypt, and hopefully you remember that this part of Egypt is called Lower Egypt. That's correct, because remember, the Nile flows this way. So this is Lower Egypt, and this is Upper Egypt. So the reason he's able to take it over so quickly is Alexander, remember, he's smart, trained by Aristotle. So what he does is this. Um, when he defeats the Persians in Egypt, the way he gets the Egyptians on his side is he says to them, so, um, you know, I just want to say, Egypt, you're pretty cool. I study a lot about you. And, um, you know, I'm a fan. And the Egyptians are like, how did you beat the Persians? They've been in control of this some, for so long. And Alexander says, I don't know. Horus was inside of me. I had help from Horus. The Egyptians are like, Horus is inside of you? That means you're the pharaoh. Now, Alexander is saying that for political gain. So he studied the Egyptian religion and then used that to control the people. Like I said, very smart guy. So then he's going to move into Mesopotamia, and there is a major, major battle in Mesopotamia called Guagamela. Now, something I mentioned also, the Persian king at the time um, that Alexander is taking over the Persians, is Darius III. Yes, so he is related to Xerxes, he's related to Darius. This is generations and generations later, so we're up to Darius III. So, back to this. So, Alexander, like I said, never loses a battle. That doesn't mean he didn't come close to losing battles, but he didn't lose. Um, then goes deep into the heart of the Persian territory, takes over the capital city, Persopolis, goes up north, stops at the Himalaya Mountains because they're the Himalaya Mountains, heads down, takes over parts of India, and then what happens, and I'll just pause this here, is, whoa, I didn't mean to do that. Um, well, you could still see it here. Um, he he um, faces resistance, as I was mentioning, from his troops that say they want to go back home, they're tired of fighting. If it was up to Alexander, he would have gone all the way to the Pacific Ocean probably taken on um, people that settled in ancient China and all that kind of stuff, but it wasn't in the cards. So Alexander goes back and he dies in Babylon. Um, he was almost 33 years old when he died. He was 32, um, but his birthday was coming up pretty close. Um, and he actually dies in the old palace of Nebuchadnezzar, who you might remember from the Chaldeans, uh, or from me saying the words Nebuchadnezzar. So um, what he does is, because when you're Alexander, you're going to stay in the nicest places. So he gets sick. He's like, oh, we got to we gotta stop for a while. I'm sick. And he ends up dying in um, Babylon while he's staying at Nebuchadnezzar's palace. No, Nebuchadnezzar isn't there. Nebuchadnezzar is long dead because his, this is way later in history. All right, so back to the notes. All right, now, Alexander's goal is he wants to unite the world in peace by controlling all of it. He wants to conquer the world so there would be peace. 
Think about that for a second. Yeah, pretty, uh, pretty interesting. So here's how he decides to unite his people. He believed the secret to success would be Macedonians, Greeks, and Persians all getting along. Now, as you learned in Philip II, Macedonians don't like the Greeks. Um, Greeks don't like the Persians. So he's got to find a way for them all to coexist. So um, Persian soldiers he lets into his army. That gets some of the Persians on Alexander's side. But then here's his strategy. He marries a Persian woman and has many of his soldiers do the same. And the reason he did that is he is part Macedonian and part Greek. And what I mean by that is Alexander's dad, Philip II, is from Macedonia. Alexander's mom was Greek. So he is half Macedonian, half Greek. So he figures if he marries a Persian, his kids will be part Macedonian, part Greek, and part Persian. And it's kind of hard to hate a culture that you are part of. So he has the soldiers do the same. He's trying to merge all three cultures. He also dresses in Persian style clothing. Um, so that way some of the Persians um, are like, oh, this guy respects our culture. Some of the Macedonians and Greeks will be like, wow, Alexander, that's a cool shirt. Where'd you get it? And he's like, oh, it's Persian. And the Greeks are like, uh, I take back what I said. And Alexander's like, no, you said it was cool. You can admit you like Persian things. Um, he also follows some Persian customs to win over the hearts of the Persians and take them over because he wants to control the whole world, the whole ancient world. Now, Alexander has a huge ego, humongous. Um, so Alexander claims he is a god living on earth and insists that people treat him this way. Now, the Macedonians and Greeks are like, uh, you're not a god. Uh, Philip's your dad. But remember what I said about Egypt. The Egyptians treat him as if Horus is inside of him. Therefore, it's the pharaoh. And that gets to Alexander's head. He's He, he always has a soft spot for Egypt because he's like, they literally worship the ground I, wa I walk on. Um, there are Greeks that hate that Alexander was treating the Persians equally. Um, and in ancient Greece, anyone that didn't speak Greek was known as barbaroi, which is like a barbarian, someone uncivilized. And basically, it comes from this kind of thing where if someone wasn't speaking ancient Greek, meaning they were a Persian or from somewhere else, the Greeks thought they were just uncivilized beneath them. Um, and a lot of times these people looked like this guy, <laughs> you know, um, because that's how a lot of people looked in ancient times. And the Greeks, you know, under Alexander's command, always had to have short hair and things like that. So this is where the word barbarians comes from, because who handles barbarians? Well, that would be a barber that cuts their hair. So that's where that comes from as well. Now. Alexander's hope of uniting all three groups, Macedonians, Greeks, and Persians, eventually fails, all because he died young. Who knows? If Alexander lived a long, healthy life, maybe he would have succeeded, but the early death of Alexander kind of ends that. All right. Now, Alexander is this conqueror, and as he's conquering, he builds, has cities built, and he makes 70 cities as, he's con as he conquers Persia. 16 of them he names after himself. Alexandria. Now you might be thinking, Alexandria, that's, you know, normally a female name. Well, cities are usually referred to as females. I don't know why, like boats too. Um, so the Ia is the female form of Alexander. So it is named after him. Um, he encourages the Greeks and Macedonians to move to new places. And remember how I mentioned Egypt has a soft spot in his heart. He makes the biggest, most famous Alexandria in Egypt. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Oh, and that little bit is right now. Um, the most famous Alexandria is Egypt. 
it becomes a center of trade and learning, and Greeks from all over the world go to study in Egypt. Now, Alexandria has two great harbors, and I'll show you some pictures in a second. Um, and a lighthouse was built that was 400 feet high, and it's one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So, if we look at the picture as it loads, wait for it, wait for it. See, I had this all queued up, and then what happens is I scrolled, I like went to the other tab, and then things reloaded. That's not it. Let me scroll down. We're getting ads. There it is. So um, this is a drawing of what the Lighthouse of Alexandria would have looked like. So here's the two kind of harbors on the sides. Um, and this is an amazing feat in ancient times, hence why it's on the list of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Um, the good thing about a lighthouse and the point of a lighthouse is in ancient times, at nighttime, it's totally dark and if you're a ship, you're not going to be able to land because you can't see where the rocks are and you don't want to crash your boat. But with a lighthouse like this, that means that ships could come into harbor during the nighttime. And that means the economy and business of Alexandria has an advantage over all the other city states that don't have a lighthouse. So all of that thanks to Alexander. Now, this lighthouse was actually called the pharos, um, which is, pharos is connected to the Greek word for light, which is where that comes from. Unfortunately, just like many of the other Seven Wonders of the Ancient World, a uh, lighthouse of Alexandria does not exist anymore um, due to natural disaster. That's what took it down. Now, the best school in Alexandria was given this title, the museum, which is why Today, museums are called places of learning. It is a center for poets, writers, philosophers, and scientists, and the Library of Alexandria was the largest in the ancient world until, unfortunately, it burned down. Um, famous people in ancient times, like this guy, Euclid, did lots of research in Alexandria, and Euclid created geometry. So if you like geometry, like angles and stuff and... Um, I'm trying to think of geometry terms, parallelograms and perpendicular and isosceles and all that kind of stuff. Um, that happens there. Ooh, speaking of geometry stuff, now some of you that are in super advanced math, you might know this, and some of you that don't know what I'm about to say, you'll eventually learn this. There is a famous Greek guy named Pythagoras that during this time creates something that we still use today in math called the Pythagorean theorem. Um, it's the formula a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And basically what that means is Pythagoras figured out a formula that if you know two sides of a triangle, you can figure out the third triangle side measurements. Um, pretty cool. Didn't mean to go into math, but it happened. Um, all right, here's how it all ends for poor Alexander. Um, now, as I mentioned, he got sick on the way back to Greece when his troops are like, we're not fighting anymore, we're done, we're tired. Alexander's angry about that, but he was like, all right, let's go back home. Dies in Babylon, as I mentioned. He was almost 33, as I mentioned. He was 32, but his um, 33rd birthday was close um, when he died. Um, scientists and historians think he had possibly malaria. His symptoms were similar to malaria. Now, malaria is an, a disease that exists today, but it's, it's something that we take precautions for. Um, there are certain parts of the world, not the United States, certain parts of the world that have mosquitoes that um, if they bite you, you can get sick with malaria, and it's a very serious disease. Um, those mosquitoes don't live in America, they live in other places. In fact, what the United States does is if you're going to travel to one of the countries where malaria exists, you have to um, sometimes get shots or sometimes take medicine. It's called malaria pills. Um, that means that if that mosquito bites you, you're not going to get sick. So we have precautions today against that, but obviously Alexander did not. As I mentioned, he died in Nebuchadnezzar's palace. His body was wrapped in gold and placed in a glass coffin into a royal tomb at his favorite city, 
Alexandria. Now, after Alexander dies, the empire is divided up into thirds. So those Greek city-states go back to being independent Greek city-states. The parts of India that he conquered go back to being um, in India. And you know what? Do I still have my map up? Yeah, I do. Okay. So what I mean is the Greek city-states go back to being independent Greek city-states. These pieces of India go back to being independent Indian city-states. Um, so these three guys take the rest of the empire. Antigonus takes the old homeland of Macedonia. Ptolemy, now I know there's a P there, so you think it's like Ptolemy, but it's like pterodactyl. You don't pronounce the P, although some of you were probably like, but I call it pterodactyl. No, Ptolemy gets to Egypt. So he gets all this. And then this guy, Seleucus, gets this piece of the old Persian empire to rule. All right, and these are all generals in Alexander's army, and you can take a wild guess. Who is the most powerful? It's this guy, Seleucus, because he got the most land. All right. Now, even though Alexander died, one of his biggest things he did is he spread Greek culture. Because, let's go back to my empire map, as Alexander's conquering all this, and he's building all those Alexandrias, these um, 16 Alexandrias, 70 cities overall, they're setting up like Greek shops and Greek pottery and Greek, all kinds of stuff, Greek architecture. So you didn't have to go to Greece anymore to get Greek things. Alexander's face was even on some of the coins of these lands, which is interesting. Trade starts to grow. Um, spices, ivory, incense. You'll remember from when we talked about Egypt, that's a nice smelling smoke. Pearls, wood, glass, metals, linen, olive oil, wine, pottery, and wheat all get treated, traded between the old parts of Alexander's empire, everything from Egypt to India. So massive trade continues here of all these Greek products. Now, Greek culture starts to influence lots of things. The laws of these lands start to be more like Greeks. As we mentioned, more people start to speak Greek, so the language. Calendars, everyone starts following the same calendars. Coins, we mentioned, lots of people put Alexander on their coins. Teaching ideas, um, the great philosophers influence a lot of schools, like the museum, and then banking practices as well. So, Greece, meaning like the homeland of Greece, was never the same again after Alexander's death. There were big factories set up in parts of what used to be Alexander's empire. And with Greek culture all over the place, you didn't have to go to Greece to get Greek things. Meaning if you lived out here in the heart of, Meso uh, of Persia, I was about to say Mesopotamia, but I could say Mesopotamia too, or over here, over here, there is a city established that has Greek things. So it wasn't like, oh, I want to go to Greece to get this. I can be like, I'm just going to go to the city because everyone has Greek things. So because everyone's speaking the Greek language now too, a lot of young Greeks decide, I'm leaving Greece and I'm going to go live somewhere else because they speak Greek, they have Greek things. It's, it's, you know, it's like a home away from home. So they emigrate, which means to move out of a place to settle somewhere else. So not to confuse with immigrate, immigration is when people come into a country. Emigrate or emigration is when you leave a country. Now, um, this is where English is tricky. So yes, if I was moving from the United States to Great Britain, I would be emigrating from the United States and immigrating into Great Britain. Yeah, super confusing. All right, now, by 146 BCE, Greece's population is smaller and it can't stop ancient Rome from coming in and taking over the Greek city-states because a lot less people live there because they're spread all over the world. Now, Alexander is a beloved figure in history. There's a reason why he's known as the Great. 
Um, somebody writes a book in ancient times about Alexander, and that's the title, Alexander the Great. And the nickname sticks, but it still plays a role in politics today. So um, lots of people in the Mediterranean view Alexander as this great person from history. And there's actually severe controversy between the country of Macedonia and the country of Greece all over Alexander the Great's legacy. And I'll show you what I mean. So in the capital city of Macedonia um, called Skopje, they have a humongous monument to Alexander the Great. So the Macedonians are like, Alexander is from Macedonia. He's Macedonian, and we're going to celebrate. So you can see this big old statue in the center of their capital city, and there's the people. Um, you can see it close up here. Now, this guy um, we're going to learn about in the Alexander Notes Part 2. This is his favorite horse, Bucephalus. Um, so this is in Macedonia. Now, here's where the controversy is. Um, the country, Macedonia, says Alexander is from Macedonia. The country of Greek says, no, Alexander is from Greece. So it got so bad, Macedonia named its airport Alexander the Great International Airport. And Greece is like, you can't name it that. That's, he belongs to us. And Macedonia is like, no, he belongs to us. And Macedonia wanted to join NATO, which is a huge alliance today. And Greece said no. So all over and all over Alexander the Great. And the controversy goes further over the name Macedonia. And I'm going to show you a map to kind of show you. Okay, so here is Greece. Here is Macedonia. Now, it has a different name here, and I'm going to explain why. So, um, you know how the United States has states like New Jersey, New York, California, all that? So do a lot of countries. And the state that is right over here in Greece is Macedonia. That's what they call it. This is the country of Macedonia. And very recently, we're talking like less than two years ago, about a year ago, an agreement is reached. The Greeks said, we will let you, Macedonia, enter NATO, this trade alliance, this alliance of, of military and trade and all this stuff. We're not going to block your membership, but you have to change your country's name because this to the Greeks is the real Macedonia. And um, the country that used to be called Macedonia agrees because they really want in that alliance. Um, they also agree to change the name of the airport in Skopje. It's now just Skopje International Airport. It doesn't say Alexander Great, but Skopje still has the big statue and everything like that. So now this country that used to be called Macedonia is now called North Macedonia. And the state over here that is part of Greece is still called Macedonia. So essentially the argument about Alexander Great was this. Um, Greece said, yes, Alexander is from Macedonia. This part that is called Macedonia in Greece. And the Macedonians are like, yes, Alexander is from Macedonia, our country of Macedonia. So um, there's controversy even still today regarding his heritage. When really Alexander is part Macedonia and part Greek so why can't they just share his legacy? I don't know. You know how people get. All right. So that is fill in the blanks, fill in the blank notes, part one. See you later. As I can stop recording. This is probably the most fun for you is watching me record. Hit stop.